At least 12 members of Myanmar's security forces were killed by Rohingya insurgents in late August 2017, which prompted the Burmese military to retaliate with excessive force. The ensuing violence triggered the exodus of about 400,000 ethnic Rohingyas. Many of the refugees brought with them testimonies of atrocities and extrajudicial killings. The United Nations declared that the violence seemed like a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Meanwhile, the Burmese government denies wrongdoing and emphasizes the threat of the Rohingya-based insurgency that operates in Rakhine province. Officials in Myanmar also accuse the Rohingyas of setting their own villages ablaze and claim that international aid workers were rendering assistance to the insurgents. In this report we will separate fact from fiction and examine the crisis in Rakhine state. My name is Shirwan and welcome to Caspian Report. Myanmar is no stranger to internal strife. And although the country is predominantly Buddhist Burmese, the government recognizes 135 distinct ethnic groups. The current crisis centers on the Rohingya, who happen to be a Muslim ethnic group that is excluded from this list. Government officials in Nepido believe that the Rohingyas migrated to Rakhine state in the mid-20th century following the exit of the British Empire. As such, the Burmese government denies the idea that the Rohingyas belong within their borders. There is some truth in this, as significant immigrations did occur during the era, but the influx was not exclusive to the Rohingyas. For instance, by some accounts, up to 2 million Chinese people immigrated to northeast Myanmar in the 1990s. Furthermore, the Rohingya presence in Rakhine state can be traced back to the Kingdom of Arakan in the 8th century. At the very least, Rohingyas have a diverse background, and claims to legitimacy are more complicated than portrayed in most media outlets. In fact, the situation was not always this bad. In the 1960s, Rohingyas had councillors and officials in the Burmese parliament and the government. Relations began to break down when the civilian government was replaced by the military in 1962, which was headed by General Ney Vinh. The military government was desperate to reject the memory of British colonization and Japanese humiliation during World War II. Under these circumstances, the military sought to promote what they considered indigenous Burmese culture and identity. The program ended up marginalizing many groups of minorities. At best, it was a policy of cultural assimilation. At the worst, it was ethnic cleansing. Some minority groups aligned with the central government, while others negotiated for political power, still others engaged in fighting. In Kachin, Shan, Kokan and Rakhine provinces, insurgent unrest was especially notable. What's more is that the socialist economic policy of the military government failed dramatically. As major industries were nationalized, trade to GDP ratio declined from about 40% to approximately 25% in 1970. Needless to say, sectarian violence and the financial crisis brought severe instability to Myanmar. In the following decades, as ethnic insurgencies surged, the central government struggled to assert its authority over the countryside. That said, of all the ethnic groups in Myanmar, the Rohingyas stood out the most because of their distinct culture and identity. As relations between the Rohingya community and the military government plummeted, the former turned to sporadic violent means to gain legal recognition. In the 1970s, the Rohingya Patriotic Front and later the Rohingya Solidarity Organization gained some notoriety since they had been trained by the Afghan Taliban. However, the Rohingya insurgency was dealt a military blow in 1978 and in 1982, revisions of Myanmar's constitution explicitly denied citizenship to 
ethnic Rohingyas, which deprived the people of many civil rights. Since then, the Rohingya have lived under apartheid-like conditions. Their freedom of movement, economic opportunities, as well as access to healthcare and education is restricted. The Burmese government went as far as to reject the term Rohingya. A decade later, in 1992, the Burmese military dealt another blow to the Rohingya insurgency and by the 2000s, separatist sentiment in the region steadily lost influence. Another dimension to the conflict are the local mobs. The thing is, Rohingyas share Rakhine province with the ethnic Rakhine people, who mostly adhere to Buddhism and account for about 60% of the total population in the area. The Rakhine people, like most other ethnic minorities in Myanmar, have long been subject to repression by the Burmese government. In recent years, however, the Rakhines, represented by the Arakan National Party and other civilian organizations, have gained a fair share of say in the national government. Since reconciliation, Rakhine groups have tried to attain greater regional autonomy. To that end, there are concerns among the Rakhine that the Rohingya insurgency is interfering with their plans for autonomy. As the interests of both communities did not match, tensions between Rakhines and Rohingyas amplified and resulted in communal violence. The current crisis was triggered when a Rohingya-based insurgent group attacked Burmese security forces in October 2016. At least nine police officers were killed and the Burmese military retaliated with a ruthless strategy they call the Four Cuts. The strategy dates to the 1970s, when Myanmar sought to undermine other patchworks of ethnic insurgencies across the country. At its core, the Four Cuts strategy seeks to cut off insurgency access to food, funds, information and recruitment. To attain this objective, the military used helicopter gunships to level Rohingya villages. The result was the devastation of the Rohingya population, which triggered a wave of refugees. The scale of destruction cannot be verified by independent sources, since the government restricts outside access to the area. However, satellite imagery corroborates the systematic pattern of abuse. Moreover, the United Nations human rights investigators concluded that the security forces of Myanmar had committed crimes against humanity. State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi rejected the United Nations report and the government blocked a new team of UN investigators from entering Myanmar. Although Aung San Suu Kyi is known as an advocate for democracy and a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, her character is now questioned by the international community due to her refusal to respond to the exodus of the Rohingyas. That said, Aung San Suu Kyi's inaction can be explained by a number of factors. First, even though she assumed the position of head of state in 2015, her political party, the National League for Democracy, has no control over the military and is bound by the constitution into a power-sharing arrangement, meaning the military retains more influence on the ground than the civilian government does. Second, if Aung San Suu Kyi is to hold her democratic mandate, she must carefully navigate through the political landscape of Myanmar. The crisis in Rakhine is held up as an example of Myanmar's Buddhist identity, and since about 80 to 90% of the country's population is Buddhist, there is very little sympathy for the persecuted Rohingyas. If Aung San Suu Kyi expressed any form of solidarity, she would be politically exposed, since it would be perceived as a failure to protect the Burmese identity. Such an occurrence would strengthen the Buddhist nationalist movement as represented by the National Development Party. Although the party performed poorly in the 2015 elections, their principal standpoint is that Muslim, Hindu and Christian minorities are not properly part of Myanmar. 
Ultimately, though, the political landscape of Myanmar is complicated. If Aung San Suu Kyi is to retain legitimacy and credibility in a nation that is mostly Buddhist Burmese, she cannot respond to the Rohingya crisis from a standpoint of morality. Doing so would empower the military, backed by the nationalist groups, as well as seize the democratization process in the country, which would trigger even worse ethnic riots. So, it may not look like it, but Aung San Suu Kyi is held hostage by the no-win circumstances. Besides the domestic politics of Myanmar, external geopolitical interests play an equally important role in the Rohingya crisis. Roughly 82% of China's crude oil and 30% of its natural gas imports pass through the Strait of Malacca which is one of Beijing's greatest geopolitical liabilities. To reduce its dependency on the strait, Chinese policymakers are working to establish an alternative energy route that passes through Myanmar's Rakhine area. The natural gas and oil pipelines that are under construction, called the Sino-Myanmar pipelines, run from their refineries in Yunnan province in China to the deep water ports of Sitwe in Rakhine. By creating an alternative energy route through Myanmar, Beijing also reduces its dependency on the Strait of Malacca. In addition, Chinese policymakers are hopeful that the energy infrastructure will be accompanied with transport logistics that will allow the landblocked province of Yunnan access to the markets of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Such a development would provide Yunnan province with the much-needed employment and capital. Meanwhile, for India, Sitwe presents a different geopolitical objective that is linked to the Siliguri Corridor. The recent crisis between Indian and Chinese troops in the Doklam area highlights the former's vulnerability. To that end, New Delhi seeks to establish the Kaladan Multi-Module Transit Transport Project, which is an alternative supply route to the strategic choke point in Siliguri. The Kaladan project goes from Calcutta to Sitwe by sea and then is linked to Palatuwe by the Kaladan River in the north of Rakhine, which then connects to Mizoram in India. Authorities in New Delhi have also expressed an interest to improve trade and security ties with Naypyidaw. As exemplified by the Thailand-Myanmar-India highway, Indian officials see Myanmar as a bridge that connects India to Southeast Asia. For New Delhi, its infrastructure projects are of utmost urgency since it allows India to counter China's influence in the region. By pursuing economic projects with India as well as China, Myanmar hopes to play both powers against one another and extract the best arrangements possible. On the other hand, it also means that the Burmese military fears that the Rohingya-based insurgency could disrupt the critical economic activities that are vital for the geo-economic fortunes of Myanmar. For the Burmese military, that is enough reason to ethnically cleanse the area. However, as Rohingyas are caught between external and internal political ambitions, the excessive abuse of the military has created a fertile ground for jihadist groups. Although radicalization has yet to materialize on a large scale, the longer the crisis endures, the more likely it is that transnational jihadists will exploit the misery of the Rohingyas. After all, people who are displaced, suppressed or isolated usually have little to lose and present an ideal environment for jihadist endeavors. This report was researched and written in cooperation with Young from Singapore. Check out geoeconomics.net for more information. Also special thanks to our contributors on Patreon who give us the resources to make these reports. If you want to be part of that process, you can do so with as little as a dollar a month. See patreon.com slash report for more, but if you cannot afford to, then don't. 
You could instead help us to reach wider audiences by sharing this video with your friends on the social media. Anyway, that's it for now. Take care and Sarol.